Luke chapter 2. I love reading this. Rick Gordon QR fire. Crackling fire. And fire was. Uh, Rick said, let fire be, and fire was. You guys know this story. It's the Christmas story. It really happened. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered, taxed, really. It always cracks me up. Here's the, I don't know that there's ever been a more powerful singular office than the first few Caesars of the mighty Roman Empire. Nobody told them what to do, or so they thought. But how many of you know that Joseph and Mary, they're not in Bethlehem at this time? Where is the Messiah supposed to be born, says the book of Micah? In Bethlehem. They're living in Jerusalem. Pardon me, they're living in Nazareth. And so how are we going to get them, what, 80 miles to the south? I know. Boink. I'll just nudge the greatest human in human estimation. And it's the, he thinks it's his idea. I feel led to, just, to mention that just a quick moment. Have you noticed that the political scenario has been a little testy as of late? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. He thought he was the honcho in charge. And as always, Lord, just like your Bible says, that you turn the hearts of kings as easily as you turn the rivers. And Lord, if I've got a grump and a grind in my own heart about the political landscape, what's my job? To pray for those that are in authority over us. What if I didn't vote for them? Ha, then I don't have to pray for them. Wrong. God says that he is doing something quite spectacular. Harvest, please try not to get too sort of too uppity or too grumpily, whatever that adjective is, because please know that God is at work. Amen? Amen. Caesar Augustus said all the world should be registered or taxed, and the census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. This is one of the places that Dr. Luke gives us an outside little historical marker, and you put all this together, we know when this is. This is two B.C. More specifically, it's the fall of 2 B.C. Uh, more specifically than that, it's September, really. It is, um, it is um, oh, come on, brain, um, not Tishri. It is, it's the fall. <laughs> the the uh, Jewish month is escaping me. This is the fall. This is near Rosh Hashanah. That's the point. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. This is 2 BC. And the reason that's going to become important is just a minute. Verse 3, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went out from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, in the city of David. Judea is like the county. It's a little bit south of where Jerusalem is, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. The, the um, Messiah, of course, is going to be directly descended from uh, David. Verse 5. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. You know what that is? Yeah, you don't get those at Walmart, swaddling clothes. These are ribbons of her own clothing. She was pretty poor, and so she sort of ripped up perhaps some old garments, and she said, I'm going to put those together, put the Savior of the world in that finery. You know, I don't know who God's PR man is. I should talk to him. If you're going to enter into the notice of all the world, and you're the King of kings and Lord of lords... We should have marching bands. And then the Lord says, easy there, Steve. Slow up, big fella. I don't do things the way the humans normally expect. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. You know what that is? That's a feeding trough. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there, was, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. 
Um, Jesus was not born in December. There's a number of reasons for that. Here's one of those sort of understandings. You wouldn't be in the open fields in December. You just wouldn't, not in this part of the country. Well, this is fall, likely early fall. Keeping watch over their fields by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood above them. The glory of the Lord shone around him, and they were greatly afraid. We've, we've mused on it before. You know what it is when you're camping at night, right? And your flickering campfires kind of going down, glowing a little less and less. That means your pupils are wide open like dinner plates. And suddenly you're going to see or this angel, whoosh, your pupils slam shut. You got to adjust for just a minute. What an awesome sight. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, good news. What's another good way of saying good news? Gospel. Of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Um, you've heard me say before, I used to think Christ was Jesus' last name, you know, born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ there. Son, Jesus. Uh, not really. It's a title. Christ in the New Testament, that's Christus of Greek. But in the Old Testament, they would have said Messiah. And who is the Messiah? Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, comma, Mighty God, comma, Everlasting Father. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus is like the son. He's not the father. Oh, he's, the, he's one and the same. There's just one God, but this amazing God has at least three different uniforms, if that's a way to say it. He's the father that no one has seen at any time and lived. Then he zips up a human suit here in the Bethlehem story to seek and save that which is lost. That's us. Then he ascends, as you well know. He's crucified on a cross. And then he is resurrected with a new multidimensional body, it would seem. And then he ascends into heaven. And then he dips back into the timeline throughout your Old Testament. If you're sensitive, you'll see him there. When Joshua fought the battle of Jericho before he did so, there was a guy that shows up. There's Joshua stroking his beard. Man, how are we going to take this city? And all of a sudden, there's a guy standing there. Who are you? I am the captain of the Lord of hosts. I have angelic armies that you know not of, Mr. Joshua. Uh, you need to be on my team. And it's in a number of places. And now the, whole, now the Lord, the same singular God, he can be with me and with you in our hearts and minds when we ask Jesus to forgive all of our sins, and then we receive his free gift of salvation. Then the Holy Spirit lives in us. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah. Hopefully in your Bible there you have written Isaiah 9 verse 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And that's where most people sort of stop. And too many churches, that's kind of their thing. That's who he is. He's the Wonderful Counselor. Whatever you need, he's got for you, which is true. But keep reading. He is also the Mighty God and Everlasting Father. I wonder if our worship might be just a tad different if we move past wonderful counselor which he certainly is and then dwell on med meditate on he is the mighty God verse 12 and this will be a sign to you you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and singing Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, and your Bible says goodwill. That's an unfortunate translation. The literal translation is God's will. Let me reread that. On earth, peace 
towards men in God's will. Not peace in general, not a generic sort of peace that'll sprinkle on all of the troubled masses. The true peace comes when we are born again and filled with the Spirit. So it was that when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I got to tell you something else that's going on right above their head. Remember how I said we know this is 2 BC? How do we know that? Um, We know of, um, I can't think of his name suddenly now, but we have Irenaeus, an early church father. And then, uh, gosh, why are these names escaping me? But he's a pretty important Roman writer. They tell us that Jesus was born um, 38 years, pardon me, 28 years after the death of Cleopatra. We know when that was because Elizabeth Taylor got killed along with Richard Burton <laughs> right about 30 B.C. We know that Jesus was born 2 B.C. We also know this is the early fall. When you get your Starry Night program out, uh, your heavenly bodies move with such precision that you can actually put together kind of a, a computer program. You can spin the cosmos ahead or spin it backwards. And if you spin back to 2 BC fall, namely around September, something quite unusual was going on right above the heads of everyone in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, what was it? If you didn't know, the Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, if you will, the stars, show forth his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech and night unto night they are not silent. Who's speaking? Who's not silent night after night? It's the constellation. Hey, isn't that the Zodiac, Steve? We're supposed to stay away from that. Yes, stay away from Zodiac and and naming your future based on sun signs. God says that's a bunch of baloney uh, from the Hebrew word uh, whatever it is. (laughs) Did you know that the Jews embraced the 12 major constellations that make up what's called the ecliptic, the proximate pathway of the sun? And every month, the sun and or moon are in one of those 12. Interesting. 12, you say? Oh, yeah. How many tribes of Israel were there? 12. And every tribe adopted one of the constellations. Hey, you know, I look up at the constellations, and I try to make out a scale or a virgin. I don't see it. Well, you have to know that those constellations weren't named because you could play connect the dots. They're named by the stars that are contained within them. It's quite a study, the Mezeroth. And before the internet, you know, what were you going to do on a hot summer night? Well, you get out of the house because it's hot in there, and you hang out on the roof. And without any light pollution and dust pollution, oh, do the stars pop. Do you know that the Jewish Mezeroth begins with Virgo? What's another way of saying Virgo? The Virgin. Next to her, the next month, the sun and the moon are going to be in um, Libra or the scales. Did you know that the primary star in Libra is Zubinal Ganubi, a price deficient? What's the other side of the scale? Offset by a price paid, Zubinal Akhrab. If you know the names of the star, it's telling a story. A virgin is going to bring forth something important, says the star names of the constellations. And then you go through Libra, the scales, and you keep cruising, and you come all the way to Concier. Not Cancer, but Concier, the crab. And if you know the names of the stars, it's an idea that God's people are sort of in a peril, in a pickle. And there is Concier looking at the virgin. I'm going to get her. But who's standing in the way? Leo. The lion. Guess what tribe adopted the constellation Leo? Judah. 
The Messiah is going to be known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Numbers 24, verse 17, God told Moses, you'll see him, capital H, that's Messiah, but not just yet. You will behold him, but not soon. A star will come out of Jacob. Now, in Leo, the prominent brightest star, and it's the sixth or seventh, maybe eighth brightest heavenly body in the sky. Uh, the number one bright, the sun. Uh, number two brightest, the moon. Number three brightest, Venus. You've been noticing on the low southern southwestern horizon. It looks like a headlight pointing right at you. Who's the next most brightest? Well, then you have Jupiter. You get down to about six or seven. You know what the brightest star is? Regulus. It's the king star. Jupiter is named after the god of many cultures, the Babylonian god. Um, and of course, the, the Roman god, Jupiter. He's the god star. Venus is the virgin star. Did you know that 2 B.C., September, you can check it out with NASA, the god star Jupiter is now circling the king star in Leo Regulus and zooming by in about for six nights you have the bright star of Regulus, the king star, right next to it, the god star, Jupiter, and then the mama star. Mama star, daddy star, and then the king star. And they're so close together, they appear to be one huge star. In what constellation? Leo, Judah. That's happening right over the heads of the narrative that we're reading here, right over their heads. What did Herod think about that? <laughs> Nothing. What did the people that were supposed to teach God's people, Numbers chapter 24, a star shall come out of Jacob? Nothing. But 900 miles away in Babylon, the intellectual descendants of Daniel are what? Why are they watching? Because Daniel told them, when you see the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, start counting. 173,880 days, then Messiah is going to be rejected. So back up a lifetime and watch the stars. And they did. And that magnificent triple conjunction, which has not happened since, was blaring from the heavens. He is here. He is here. Jerusalem. Who's here? What's on ESPN? Da -na -na, da -na -na. These guys, the intellectual descendants, the magi, uh, not magicians, but magi, magistrates. These are some honchos, some intellectually advanced people. They've been watching and they saw the triple conjunction. They put their, can, their caravan together and it takes them about three months to arrive. And then you can read about that in the book of Matthew. And they show up, we're here to see the king. Herod says, I, I thought I was king. We saw his star. Then he rouses all of his experts. Hey, you university professors. What's up with the star? Oh, yeah, look at that. That's pretty simple. Oh, we sort of saw a little something, but we don't know what it was. Well, where is this king supposed to be born? Easy, king. Micah, what city, you guys? The city of Bethlehem. And you know the tragic story that soon follows. He ordered the death of all the, all the newborns. One more time, real quickly. So it was when the angels had gone... Away from them, the shepherds. You know that the shepherds were the lowest class at that time. You know that they were ceremonially deemed unclean to worship at the temple. And what sheep are they watching, by the way? They're in the fields of Bethlehem. These are where the temple sheep are going to be raised. They're raising the sacrificial sheep that they themselves cannot use. They can't go to the temple. They can't go to meet with God. The culture and the church thing bars their admittance. 
So God says, I'll go tell them myself. And the angel is dispatched. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning the child. What was told to them? This is who? The Christ, the Messiah, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. He's here! And they are the first missionaries. And that's the Bible story for tonight. Let's all stand, do you mind? Let's hold out your candle. I love this part. Last year we were all COVID, remember that? And we had to use, did we use our, our telephones or what did we use? I'm trying to move a little closer to someone else if you can. And we'd love to do this. Jesus would say that I am the light of the world. He that follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of lives. Now where does that light begin? Somebody told you one time about the gospel. And you responded. And here you are. Hold up your candle, and I need somebody from this side of the room, come on up. And I need somebody from this side of the room, come on up. And what you're going to do is, without lighting anything or anybody else on fire, <laughs> what we're going to do is this wonderful thing we love to do. I'm going to light your candle in just a second, and light your candle. And then what you're going to do is you're going to walk back, and you're going to light the candle of the person next to you. And... Uh, this is how God's good news travels. One changed life at a time. Are you ready? See if I know how to operate this. Yes, I do. There we go. There you go. Yes. Now, uh, Chris, shut off... Uh, Shut off all of our lights. These lights here. Here you go, Papa Sal. Thank you. Wait a minute. There we go. Your life can be darkened. Your optimism can be dimmed. There can be a whole lot of challenging things all around. Notice that with a little bit of light, it can dispel quite a large volume of darkness. Notice how the light is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Harvest, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus' return is very, very near. I really do believe that. I've been studying the Bible a very long time, and I know that we're very, very close to his return. You don't have to be an expert. All God says is just be a witness. Well, what's that? A witness just tells somebody what they saw. How many of you in this room are not dead, just, just by a show of hands? As far as you know, you are living and breathing. One of the greatest witnesses in the Bible is Lazarus. Well, he, there's not one recorded word of him saying a thing. He didn't have to. What was his witness? I'm not dead, dead anymore. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I want to pray for every single family, every father, every mother, son, and daughter. There's challenges all around, Lord. But you are the light of the world. Let me shine like that. Silent night, holy night, holy is calm, holy is bright, round
Lord, you've called us to live, of all places, in northern Nevada, Reno, Lord. A whole city and community given over and known for sin. And you've called me and my family to be here for such a time as this. I pray, Lord God, just let me open up my heart, my prayer closet, and open up my mouth, Lord, to speak that Jesus Christ is here. Right over Jerusalem's head, they missed it. And Lord, what are you trying to show me as of late? Is there something that I'm missing? I cluck my tongue at those wacky Pharisees and Sadducees. <laughs> what a bunch of goobers, they missed it. But Lord, is there something that I'm not catching? Have, my, have I hugged my wife enough? Have I prayed for my husband? Have I interceded for my kids? Lord, am I praying for that person that I work with? In Jesus' name, Lord, let me be a light to them. I don't want to miss it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hold, hold your candle up. Look at that. Don't light anybody's hair on fire. <laughs> awesome, you guys. Amen? Amen, brother. All right, now blow them out, but not hard, so don't blow, blow hot wax on somebody.